Um, my name is Ed Cox. I'm director of IPPR North. Um, for those of you that uh, haven't heard of us before, we're part of the Institute for Public Policy Research, which is a national think tank. I think we're the only national think tank um, that has offices actually outside of the Westminster bubble. Um, we uh, have an office here in Spinningfields in Manchester and another in Newcastle. And um, we focus a lot of our attention on the northern economy and how that works. And increasingly, the relationship between the economy um, and devolution. And if you don't mind, uh, I'd just shamelessly plug three uh, reports which I think are of great relevance to um, today's um, conversation. Um, one is a report we wrote um, back in 2012 called Northern Prosperity is National Prosperity, um, which very much sets out a case for how do we grow the economy to ensure that the northern economy actually contributes um, economically, nationally, uh, rather than appears a drain on the national economy. And there's a, there's a full strategy there as to how we might do that. Um, central to that um, is notions of devolution and decentralisation. So last year we published a report, I think you've got copies of the report on your chairs called Decentralisation Decade and that sets out 40 different powers that we think need to be devolved downwards to city regions and to combined authorities and to, uh, to different tiers actually um, which we think will help grow the economy but also some safeguards that are in there to make sure that this is done um, in, a, in a careful um, and planned way over 10 years which we think is absolutely critical and doesn't just become a political project so to speak. And then just today we've launched a new report um, called Developing Resilient Local Economies. Um, good practice amongst local enterprise partnerships and we've been working with a number of local enterprise partnerships to see what they're doing um, around uh, around building a resilient, a long-term economy because I think one of the things that um, characterises, if you like, uh, the work that um, the CBI does and what you, many of you do as businesses as well is take that long-term view, not just take that short-term political view that too often, I think, uh, spoils the way in which we approach economic development. So uh, we've highlighted in that new report today the things that local enterprise partnerships are doing to try and grow the economy um, into the long term. So. This morning the format's going to be very straightforward. John's going to come and make his speech in a moment. Um, we'll have a little conversation between John and I and we'll then open it up for people to um, ask their own questions and get involved in the debate um, themselves. Um, IPPR uh, is always very strong on the fact that it's not just the people in the room that are uh, involved in this discussion, uh, it's also people outside of the room as well. So if you want to tweet this morning, then please feel free uh, to do so. The hashtag is de hashtag devolution. Um, so if you want to, uh, to share what's going on, then please uh, do that. And um, I'll, I'll have a quick check. I won't be rude, but I'll, I'll have a quick check on my phone as we're, as, we're, as we're discussing things to see whether questions are coming from outside that we might want to put to John um, later on as well. Um, so I don't need to say um, any more other than to introduce John um, and to, uh, to thank John actually for, for partnering with us uh, and for CBI to partner with us um, this morning uh, in order to give this important speech. Um, I won't offer you a kind of boring introduction around John. I think most people know he doesn't really need any great introduction. But I will tell you a fact that I learned about John is he, he has the complete collection of Eagle comics from 1950 through to 1969. Um, and I will give a prize at the end to anybody who can have a guess at exactly how many Eagle Comics that might be from 1950 through to 1969. But uh, without any further ado, John, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be with you here, and thank you for all coming in first thing. And thank you, Malcolm, for hosting us and for a lovely breakfast. On the uh, town hall tower are inscribed the words, teachers to number our days. Not a bad inscription when it was put there on the clock on the 1st of January, 1879. And if I've got my arithmetic right, as well as my collection of Eagle comics rightly numbered, 2015 will mark the 50,000th day since Manchester Town Hall clock was put in place. And that struck me as interesting because actually this year, 2015, the CBI is celebrating its 50th birthday. So we've got a 50th anniversary as well. Head inside the town hall across the road and you'll find a statue of Richard Cobden, a leading figure in Manchester's industrial past and one of the city's first elected local officials. 
So where you were touching on civic and business leadership, it was happening here all that time ago. He lived in a time when local government and local business here in Manchester helped make this city the first and greatest industrial city in the world. So it's in that spirit, Ed, of conversation and cooperation that I'm delighted to be here today with IPPR North. So today, Manchester is still a success story. It's still leading the way. It's still a beacon for the opportunities that we can pursue in local leadership. But it's not the only one. I came up last night on the train from another truly global city, London. I've been this morning to Salford Quays, to Media City. If you go to Sunderland, you'll find Software City. If you get on a plane and zip across the sea to Belfast, and you'll see the Titanic Quarter. All of these are examples of leadership in economic regeneration in our cities, north and south, and all of them demonstrate the diversity, which I think is the very strength of our United Kingdom. And I say a strength because only Monday this week, the CBI launched its new economic forecast for the country, with growth predicted this year at 2.7% and at 2.6% next year. And business is planning to create jobs in every single region in the United Kingdom. But of course, there's still a long way to go. There's a long way to go to get the UK's regions and nations firing on all cylinders. If we could do that, the prize is enormous. And I think this will remain a major priority, whoever's in Downing Street, on the 8th of May. Bringing underperforming regions, a theme I know, Ed, you've been addressing, in line with the average UK growth rate, if we could achieve that prize, we would add £56 billion pounds of gross value added to the UK economy. That's quite a prize. Maybe an ambitious bar for a Finsbury flop to get across it, but it's a real opportunity when you think that the next government is still faced by a fiscal deficit of 90 billion. So we need to dig deep. We need to do pretty much anything we can. And if that's about finding ways for the North and the West to grow, rather than for London to continue to power ahead, that must be something we need to do. So today, I want to talk about how the CBI believes we can help regions and nations grow across the United Kingdom. And I want to set out, hopefully through a clear evidence-based approach, how devolution can support, rather than shake, the pillars of our united economic kingdom. And I get the, guess the grit in the oyster, the bit in this speech which is designed to be deliberately challenging for good reason, is I think we have the opportunity to support growth through devolution, but we also have the opportunity to miss doing that if we don't focus on the right way to make it happen. So let me start by just taking us back exactly five months to the morning of the 19th of September last year, the day after the Scottish referendum. People were waking up to the news that Scotland had chosen to remain in our United Kingdom, news welcomed, frankly, by CBI businesses across the country. Why? Because boosting growth in all regions and nations, I think, starts with making the most of our core unwavering strengths as a union. And I think there are four pillars on which our united economic kingdom is built. Common business taxation across the country, and that's an issue, Ed, we may come back to. A single regime of financial regulation so that we can get access to finance across the country without arbitrage. A single energy market in Great Britain. It's a bit different in Northern Ireland because it's a different island. But in Great Britain, I think the economic wiring of the country relies upon a single energy market. And I think a single labour market, a cross-border set of employment laws, a single national minimum wage, the things that enable us to employ people seamlessly. So those are four pillars for me that keep the country glued together from an economic perspective. Constitutional issues aren't really the business of the CBI. But if you want a single economic entity, 
I think you need common taxation, single financial rules, single energy market, and a single labour market. And actually, I'm pretty flexible about what else you do, but that's the glue that holds us together. That's the hallmark, if you like, of brand Britain. A single internal market means letting business trade across borders with ease. It means that all the governments across the United Kingdom have a responsibility to promote unfettered trade across the UK without cost or complexity. From Land's End to John O'Groats, this internal market generates growth and jobs. What's the evidence for that? A neat thing to assert, particularly if you're a unionist. But what's the evidence for that? Well, I'd say the following, and I said it five months and a bit ago. Scotland's biggest export partner is the rest of the United Kingdom. In fact, about 60% of Scotland's exports go south of the border within the United Kingdom. The single UK-wide regime for financial regulation and common monetary policy is an absolute root strength of the competitive business environment in Northern Ireland. Maybe across the Irish Sea, maybe part of a single energy market with the Irish Republic. But those fundamentals make Northern Ireland a success. And just to complete the picture on Wales, every day about 125,000 people travel between England and Wales for work. Many of the links are east-west, not just north-south. So those, I think, are a few examples of why we're stronger together. Since 2008, our single labour market has created 1.4 million private sector jobs. But our in internal market isn't just helping us bounce back faster at home. It's launching us into the global stage abroad, helping companies in all parts of the UK compete with ports in Dubai, manufacturers in Germany, video game designers in Canada. Day in, day out. And our internal market is a magnetic force attracting global investment. I talked about brand Britain. It's one of the reasons why Britain is Europe's number one destination for foreign direct investment. Of course, that brand has sub-brands, like any good branding structure. But the overarching strength, I think, is brand Britain. It's no mean feat, but it's not abstract theory. Think about what we've heard recently here in Manchester alone. Look at the £650 million of Chinese investment in the works for Manchester Airport set to create 16,000 jobs in the wider area. And, Ed, as your own work has shown, the North East and Yorkshire and Humberside have seen some of the highest rates in business investment over the past decade. What better proof of the pulling power of Brand Britain? So five months ago, we recommitted to that. But that wasn't the end of what happened on the 19th of September last year, was it? It was also the beginning because we kick-started on the day we knew we'd still got one United Kingdom, a new debate on further devolution across the whole of the United Kingdom. A complex debate taking place in devolved legislatures, council chambers, dining rooms, boardrooms, and here at Adelshaw Goddard this morning. And I agree with you, Malcolm, it's absolutely vital that business can and should play a constructive role in that debate. CBI's member companies are most interested in the point at which devolution comes into contact with business. We tend to be pragmatic. We're dealing with life as it is. We're trying to make money and create jobs. So what does devolution mean at the point where it touches the world of work? Fundamentally, I think, it's about who should get what powers and what powers should be devolved. But before I get into what my member companies think, I just want to set out exactly what's meant by devolution, because it's a word which means many things to many people. On the one hand, there's further devolution to nations. So since the Scottish referendum, as you know, this has been mainly focused on transferring powers according to swift timetables ahead of Burns Night in Scotland or ahead of St David's Day in Wales. Despite the short time scale, the CBI played an active role over the winter in engaging with the Smith Commission process in Scotland, which canvassed views from right across Scottish civic society. In fact, up against a tight timescale, it was a pretty good process. On the other hand, there's further devolution within nations, and that's probably 
what interests us most here this morning here in Manchester, and in particular, devolving powers to local areas within England. Now, you've mentioned several reports, Ed, that IPPR have produced here in the north. Of course, we've had the case put forward by Michael Heseltine's No Stone Unturned report in 2012, and we had Lord Adonis's review last year. The argument was in part economic, that greater powers could restore Britain's cities to their former glory as global urban centres, and it was in part democratic, that decisions should be made closer to the people affected by those very decisions. It's an important debate. But the fundamental point here, I think, is that we must ensure that the economic and the democratic cases move hand in hand. I think it's why this collaboration between IPPR North and the CBI is so important. Because it's my job to talk about the economic, but I know I'm talking about the economic at a time when you and many others need to talk about the democratic. And only by bringing them together will we find the right answers for the citizens that we all serve. And I guess what's new and fresh in this morning's meeting is there haven't been that many occasions where the economic has been central to the debate alongside the democratic. So, since the Scottish referendum, Nicola Walker, my devolution director, and I have been asking our member companies across the country for their views. And whilst recognising that the political momentum has driven this new devolution debate, companies have had one overriding message. Not everybody will want to hear this, some in the political community will be frustrated by it, but to be honest, the overriding message from John O'Groats to Land's End in every CBI meeting has been a message about caution, a message that devolution must be paced. It must be based on clear economic evidence. In particular, companies have said two things to us. They've raised concerns about the speed of further devolution, now here it's important that where promises on further devolution have been made, the Smith Commission in Scotland, or the devolution of corporation tax setting powers in Northern Ireland, that these powers are delivered in order to give businesses in the devolved nations the certainty they need. That's a given. But going forward, the precedent set by devolution by deadline is actually a matter for concern. Why do we need to rush these things? Isn't it better to get them right? So in our view, any devolution of powers must be done in a careful, considered and transparent way. And I know, Ed, that's a theme that the IPPR North have addressed as well. And frankly, there's been a bit too much of rushed backroom deals between politicians, national and local, and civil servants. Of course, they'll make the ultimate decisions. They're democratically elected. But let's have a big tent debate where the business stakeholders and other parts of civic society are in the tent. Let's take time to breathe, and above all, let's make sure we get it right. Because the alternative is what business dreads, particularly small businesses. Uncertainty, complexity, more layers, increased costs, at a moment when we can't afford them. Second, our companies stressed that further devolution must be built on strong economic foundations. It's a fundamental choice here. Are we talking about devolution and then thinking what it does for people's living standards and growth? Or are we thinking about how we improve people's living standards and get growth in the north and then thinking how devolution can help us do that because it most certainly can. So for me devolution shouldn't be about being different for its own sake and there's a little bit of that sometimes in the debate. It should be a means to an end and I think it's my mission that that end is economic growth across the United Kingdom. And I've said, let's ask the question, how does devolution fit into plans for growth, rather than how does growth fit into plans for devolution? Business wants to see evidence of the economic effect of new powers, evidence that further powers will complement, not constrict, growth, jobs and investment. So in practical terms, how do we seize the opportunities of devolution? And how do we avoid the pitfalls? Because all the CBI members we've talked to are optimistic about this agenda. It's a positive opportunity if we can seize it, but we need to get it right. And we think there are three 
basic criteria for what I call growth-friendly devolution. So how are we going to get growth-friendly devolution? Well, one really builds on what I've already said. A clear assessment of the impact a particular power will have for better or worse. What's the evidence that devolving this power will boost growth? Does it respect my four pillars of a united economic kingdom? And that's quite a big test. Two, we need a clear demonstration of better leadership. We tend to talk about structures. At the end of the day, it's people who deliver a better society. It's people who deliver growth. Elected politicians, public sector workers, private sector entrepreneurs. And there's plenty of opportunity for us to work together. So this could be local leaders working with their neighbours through structures like combined authorities, where Manchester is rightly held up as leading the way. Or, if I'm thinking of the Celtic nations, members of devolved legislatures promoting pro-growth policies. You might say that's the easiest of tests. Who'd be against that? Well, it's not always easy to achieve, is it? If you look at the continuing challenges of achieving consensus and collaboration around the Northern Ireland executive table, all the politicians in Northern Ireland, and I met them recently in Belfast, are committed to more growth in Northern Ireland. It's a part of the United Kingdom that desperately needs more growth. But finding the way to achieve it has been part of the problems of their coalition style of government. And three, after leadership, a clear commitment, and I think this is the bit that's really getting missed at the moment, a clear commitment to minimise bureaucracy bureaucracy and complexity. It's one thing small businesses in particular hate, and it's mostly small businesses who are members of the CBI, is endless complexity and bureaucracy. All these things are done for good reasons, but when you add them up, do they leave, deliver a good purpose? I'll be this bold. I think in England, the myriad of growth deals, city deals, community budgets, layered on top of each other, have become a Tower of Babel for business. Making devolution clear and intelligible must be the priority for the next government, whoever they are. And for local bodies that want to set out the economic case for enhanced powers, and we've had local politicians across the country queuing up to say, give me the chance, I think there's a clear quid pro quo here. If they want the chance, let's see them commit to simplification to structural reform, to taking tough choices on budgets of taxpayers' money, and tough choices in a challenging fiscal climate. Now, Manchester, as I've already mentioned, is an obvious example where I think we have a clear sense that devolved powers are beginning to meet these criteria, that they are beginning to complement efforts towards jobs, growth, and investment. Because I think we've seen strong leadership from Manchester's combined authority, putting forward a clear evidence-based case for how specific powers could unleash greater Manchester's potential to drive regional growth here in the North West. I think we see some good practice from some of the local enterprise partnerships. That would be another good example. To go a bit further south, and my passion for boosting Britain's creative industries, look at the collaboration between Buckinghamshire County Council, which is not far from where I live, and the Buckinghamshire Thames Valley LEP, working together to support the expansion of Pinewood Studios, one of our most fantastic national assets for our film industry. When they work well, LEPs allow business and politics to come together across a place, draw up a plan based on local facts on the ground and receive funding in return for that plan. That's why we welcome cross-party agreement on decentralising budgets from Whitehall to English LEPs and we want to see this growth-focused approach strengthened in the next Parliament. But of course, there are other devolved powers which would clearly fall short of the criteria I've mentioned. In theory, some powers could actually restrict or constrict growth. And this may be an area egg for further conversation this morning, because I know IPPR and the CBI might have slightly different views on this. The example I'm thinking of is the devolution of tax-varying powers to local authorities. Now, I'm rather long in the tooth at the CBI, and my very first CBI job, and I was in short trousers at the time, of course, as a young graduate, was helping local branches of the CBI 
deal with local authorities before we had the uniform business rate. And I flogged myself up and down the country, going into conversations between local entrepreneurs of local CBI branches with, count with councillors, arguing about the size of the business rate before it was made common across the United Kingdom. It wasn't a happy experience. I'm not saying that's where we are 30 years later in our relations with local government, but it's where we were then. And I can remember a time when some local authorities raised business rates to four times the level of Westminster Council. So we need to ensure that those who set taxes think about that growth test that we had. Business has little appetite to refer to those days of tax escalation at local level because business doesn't have a vote. But in principle, we are very supportive of enhanced tax retention powers to give these new forms of local leadership more opportunity to make a major difference, to invest in local priorities like infrastructure and housing. So examples like the business rate retention scheme, the earn back model here in Manchester, and tax increment financing in London and Scotland, these are all things I think business welcomes and can get behind in principle because they're not fragmenting my united economic kingdom, they are allowing people to retain the benefits of pro-growth policies. So let me pull Ed to a conclusion, because I think you've heard enough from me this morning. Business spoke up during the Scottish referendum, and in doing so, I genuinely believe we made a real impact on a debate that was crucial to our future as a country, and my locus, our future economic success. I guess my message this morning is it's opened a new journey, and that journey is to debate devolution in England. And business must be equally clear that it needs a strong voice in today's debate on further devolution. And perhaps across the country as a whole, that voice from business has not yet been sufficiently heard. I'll be honest with you, it is a voice at the moment of caution asking politicians to think twice before pressing ahead too quickly with decisions which have real economic consequences. It's a voice asking them to listen to their head, not just their heart, because a lot of the issue on devolution is a matter of the heart when it comes to devolving powers. And it's a voice reminding us for all the entrepreneurs in CBI's membership, small, medium and large, that we need to think global lifting up all parts of the United Kingdom to the world stage by building on the strength of our internal market. Yes, business needs greater clarity, both around the existing devolution settlements and the exciting potential new powers on offer. There's no doubt that devolution, done properly, can be just that opportunity. So let's take the time to get it right. Let's make sure any devolved powers respect the integrity of the single united economic kingdom. Let's make sure they're rooted in economic evidence, not driven by political expediency. And let's make sure they complement our efforts to create jobs and growth for our neighbours and our workers across the United Kingdom. If we do this right, we can make sure that the people in all regions and nations see their fair share of the UK's new prosperity. Thank you very much.